and we have supplied this uh, to a number of First Nation communities, the Atlantic Fisheries Fund and the like. So um, next slide, please. The, the advantage of this is that it will work on your laptop, it will work on your tablet, it will work on essentially any computer. Currently the model that we're looking at is working off of the internet, but we can give you a self-standing executable that you can use for EMO purposes. Um, we have a, uh, I forget the, is Angela Hoffner. Uh, she contacted me when we had the, uh, uh, the threat of Hurricane Teddy and she had your model and also the, the model of, Luna, of, of Mahone Bay. So she was gonna monitor that for storm surge. So uh, it can be used for operational purposes as such as what you have done and you can use it for EMO. Um, next slide, please. Um, once again, it's all about communicating scientific data for people who don't have a science background in a real uh, time environment in an engaging way. Thank you, next slide. Now, um, this, this presentation uh, has been left with you. I encourage you to go and look at this video that will give you some of the idea of the research we've been doing, including uh, the ability of virtual reality. But having said all of that, uh, I'd like to go into the, uh, the actual application itself. How's my time? You've got about six minutes. Okay, thank you. Can you, can you find it on, on, okay. Well, I guess I'll take this dead air time to, 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 okay, great. Here's the application. Now, uh, this is connected to the internet. I understand your internet is speed is slow. Uh, I, could you click start for us? Um, very quickly, I'm going to go through these, these uh, introductory slides. Um, basically, this is a, a, a liability slide. Please click next. Um, this is totally uh, usable by touch screens on phones or tablets and wheeled mice. So it's available on all platforms. Next. Um, it will here in this particular thing. It sort of talks about how we calibrate it and put in the chart datum offsets. As as you know from being a seafaring town, um, the uh, low tide is not low tide. There's regional offsets. We uh, allow you to have sliders to play with tide and storm surge. Plus, we have some of the information in discrete buttons from CBCL. Next. On the side, which you can't see here, um, we yeah, we jumped ahead a little bit, but that's fine. The the icons there, the, the, the one on the top right is the full screen. Is it, can I take this mask off? Okay, thank you. Um, that allows you to go to different areas, the second pin. There's resources that are both internal and external that are available in the third tab. There's some embedded photos and that can be updated by your citizens if you, or if you supply them. And, and the, the fourth button down, fifth button down, the gear cog is the most important one and we'll get into that shortly. Can you go and select the sewer treatment plan? It's near the top left-hand corner. Yes, please click on that. Um, it should zoom in there. Your internet's extremely slow. There's a pop-up. Could you click the exit? Thank you. Uh, some people will recognize that. The, there's a slider on the bottom. Can you see where it says tide? Can you take that up to 2.4 meters? Two point three is great. 
Now, this condition, other people may have seen. This is a high tide event, uh, fairly common in this time of year. Um, storm surge, take it up to a meter for me. Um, as we say, it's a bit more than a meter. Yeah, there. So there's an event that we would have seen in Dorian. Now that shows you what has happened. And now what we've done is we've taken the information from um, CBCL. If you go under the gear cog, there uh, we'll show you how to put. We're going to put a check valve in the culvert, the drainage culverts under the road, the bypass road. Yeah, it would be tide valve on off. All of a sudden you see once you have a, a flood, a one-way valve there, the water levels haven't changed, but there's no ingress to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, could you go into the gear cogs again? And go under flooding scenarios. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I can't see, but somewhere here, I think you have to scroll down to the pop-up. Yes, a little bit more, please. Thank you. So we've taken the data from uh, CBL's report and we've incorporated sea level rise uh, based on, on their calculations. The report is embedded at a link, in a link in this pop-up. And we've also have re return periods for different storms. So to be very alarmist, I would like to go and, and pick a sea level rise of 2100, please. Okay, and then pick a return storm event for 10 years. And then hit select. Oh, you got, you got 20, don't you? You can see the projections for the town are somewhat severe. If you zoom out. Um, yeah, that would be your right button. If you can do that, and if you can't, that's fine. If you take the the, the if you keep the storm, uh, take the, uh, the the time horizon at yeah. twenty one hundred, but put a ten year or hundred year storm event, you're going to see that sea level rise is the largest threat, not the storm events. See how it hardly changed. That's the science from CBCL in a visual format. And uh, how's my time? You got a minute. Okay, I want to thank you all for, for this. I'm open for questions. Thank you for letting me take the mask off so I can breathe. And, uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. It's science, it's real, it's uh, interactive, and it will allow you and you people to, uh, to actually, it being a 3D model, if there was something that you wanted to do to change it, like say to raise a lower, or, or raise or lower a road bed, uh, that's all uh, doable in the software, but we'd have to go and fix it. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. I will open the floor. If any councillors have any questions, and Barry will leave five minutes for that. Seeing none, thank you, Barry. We'll move on to our next presentation, which is the wastewater treatment plant flood and saltwater intrusion study reports and recommendations. And for that, we have Sarah Enslin with us from CBCL. Uh, could I excuse myself, uh, Mayor and Council? By all means. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sarah? Thanks. Can we get him on the line? Uh, hello. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? It's Danker Kaline from CBCL Limited. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, right, great. Everyone can hear me okay? We can. Perfectly. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen with you uh, here. Just one moment. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'll take 10 minutes on this presentation, and then we can get into some questions. 
So my name is Denker Kalein, and I'm the group lead of the Coastal Engineering Group at CBCL. And we were asked to look at the flood event that took place at the Lunenburg Wastewater Treatment Plant and then to assess um, potential solutions. So I'm going to present our work tonight and then uh, take any questions you may have. So as of everybody, of course, uh, everybody remembers in 2019, we had Hurricane Dorian um, you know, hit Nova Scotia on September the 7th, which was a little bit earlier than Hurricane Juan in 2003. And both these hurricanes hit towards the uh, east of Lunenburg. And here you can see an output on the left of the wind field where you know the, the pink is very, very high winds over hundred kilometers per hour, the eye hitting exactly over Halifax and actually the stronger winds on the side, on the, on the outside of the eye actually hit, hit Lunenburg. Uh, so this event uh, caused pretty severe flooding in, in several parts of the town. So the wastewater treatment plant itself is situated on Lunenburg Back Harbor. And of course it's connected to the harbor by a series of culverts to a marsh. Uh, and this marsh is inundated uh, at high tide uh, and also is an important drainage outlet. So shortly uh, during the hurricane and after, this is what the situation was like. You can see that uh, there's very high water levels in the marsh. Uh, the rail to trail was also completely submerged by water. Uh, however, the highway uh, 332 was still dry. And that's a key piece of information. So if we go to the plant itself, you can see that in front of the plant, uh, water levels were up to the maintenance door, the bay door itself, which means that water had entered the plant. The water that entered the plant caused, of course, severe damage um, and, and is the result of why we're looking at this study today. So the key questions that we wanted to answer is what contributed to the Dorian flooding? Where did the flooding originate from? What design events and flood levels should be considered to develop a solution to prevent flooding? And what can be done to mitigate the flooding in the near and long-term future? So we wanna consider what we can do today and, and of course the next couple of decades. So the approach that we took is the first thing we did was analyze all these water levels and Barry did a great job of presenting some of those. And I'll go through that again. And we looked at historical data, but we also looked at future data. So we looked at climate change projections and that's mainly got to do with um, sea level rise, but of course also looking at things like hurricane patterns and, and potential for hurricane impacts. So we actually simulated hurricanes. So we have these models, these computer models that can simulate different hurricane conditions uh, in and around Lunenburg and the storm surge that comes with that. And I'll show a bit of that today. Then we generated flood maps for various scenarios. And using those flood maps, we could look at short, medium and long-term solutions at the wastewater treatment plant. So this plot is, uh, there's a lot on this slide, but essentially what we're looking at here is the sea level rise projections for Halifax. These are very recent projections using more recent modeling from 2018, so very new data. And I think it's important to point out that at a minimum in the next 50 years, we can expect half a meter of sea level rise in the town of Lunenburg, which is, is very significant. There are extreme scenarios um, where potentially the Antarctic ice sheet would collapse that can have even greater effects on sea level rise. But for now, I think it's safe to say that, you know, within the next 50 years, we can anticipate that half meter sea level rise scenario. And by the year 2100, over a meter of sea level rise. So these are very significant numbers and have implications on all the coastal infrastructure. Um, so with our hurricane models, we simulated Hurricane Juan and we simulated Hurricane Dorian. And the really uh, good thing is that we had measured uh, data and information from Hurricane Juan collected in the Ludenberg Harbor. So we were able to calibrate and, and validate our models using that information. And what was really interesting is if you look at the figure on the top right, you see that in the back harbor, there's a dark red shade. And in the front harbor, there's a lighter green and yellow shade. And what, what we found was that in the hurricane passage, there's actually greater water levels in the back harbor because the water piles up in the back harbor than there is in the front harbor. And this offset is about 25% difference. 
So um, whatever the water level was, there's about, um, you know, in this case, it was 70 centimeters in the front har harbor and 90 centimeters in the back harbor. And when we simulated Dorian, which actually has a very similar path to Hurricane Juan, we got exactly the same result. Uh, we got a higher water level in the back harbor than we did in the front harbor. And this uh, corresponds with anecdotal evidence that we also had that people generally believe that water levels in the back harbor are higher. Uh, so this is a very important finding. And what we also found was that during Hurricane Dorian, we had higher water levels in Ludenburg than during Hurricane Juan, which also is uh, reasonable because during Hurricane Juan, there wasn't any major flooding at the wastewater treatment plants that we know of. So all of these things indicate that, you know, our modeling is showing these spatial differences in water levels and the different effects in the front harbor versus the back harbor. So this is what the hurricane models looked like, uh, the wind fields for Hurricane Dorian and Juan. At the top being Dorian, this is so that's that, that big hurricane eye that's moving counterclockwise. Um, and we did a sensitivity. And that is what if these hurricanes had hit Lunenburg directly? Because of course, both these hurricanes hit to the east of Lunenburg. So we simulated scenarios, different types of hurricanes, different trajectories, and ones where, you know, this one, for example, where the hurricane's hitting slightly to the um, west of Lunenburg. And what we found is very interesting. We found, uh, again, there's a lot on this slide, but we found that if there's a direct hit on Lunenburg, there's no more difference between water levels in the back harbor and the front harbor. And, uh, the water levels are the same in the front and the back harbor. We also noted that if Hurricane uh, Dorian had hit directly, it would have added an additional half meter of storm surge, which would far exceed the one in 100 year event. Um, so this is important information because it informs our decisions on design. Uh, we can't take for granted that there's always gonna be a difference in the back harbor and the front harbor in terms of water levels. So we have to design for the worst case scenario, which is that there will be equal water levels in both the front harbor and the back harbor. So with that in mind, we also had to look at the situation on land because of course it isn't just the storm surge and the, and the waves and the tides and the sea level rise. There's also the rain that comes with hurricanes and Dorian had a lot of rain. So we found that Dorian had a hundred, one in a hundred year rainfall event. So a huge amount of rain in a short period of time. Now the watershed for the wastewater treatment plant is relatively small. It's only 48 hectares. Um, and what we found in this was that the salt marsh can actually hold a lot of water. So it can retain a significant amount of runoff for relatively short periods of time, which again, illustrates how important it is that there's a culvert because that culvert allows the rainwater to drain into the ocean. The problem is if we have storm surge coming through the culvert the opposite direction, it won't drain. So the marsh needs to be able to hold the water for long enough that when the storm surge goes down again, the water can drain out of the marsh and prevent flooding on the land side. So when we ran those calculations, we found that during a typical storm and a hurricane event, the marsh has enough storage to hold water for the surge to go down again and for the water to drain out to the sea. And then using all that information, we recreated the flood map for Dorian. And this is exactly kind of the situation that we think occurred during Dorian. So the wastewater treatment plant, the floor itself sits at plus 1.7 meters. The Dorian flood level was 2.1, plus 2.1 uh, meters. So there is you know, a solid um, 40 centimeters there of flood elevation or up to even half a meter in the plant, which is what they experienced. What's important to note is that the road is at plus 2.5 meters. So the road um, did not get flooded. And if the culvert had been plugged or, or blocked, we wouldn't have experienced the flooding in the wastewater treatment plant. So let's talk about solutions. So there's three levels of solutions. The short-term solution, something to do today would be to plug these with temporary culvert plugs, these inflatable type, uh, just to get through the next season. And even with Hurricane Teddy, you know, that was a, another event that came very quickly uh, that would be a good solution. Uh, localized flood proofing around the doors and the bays in the plant itself could be done with sandbags. But of course, these are short-term solutions. 
So medium turn solutions are uh, installing uh, gates on these culverts. There's two kinds of gates. There's a passive gate that moves at the tide. The problem with this gate type is that it would block um, water from, from exchanging freely into the um, marsh and it's nice marsh habitat. And to maintain that marsh, it's better to have the culverts open all the time and to control them manually. Uh, so when a storm comes, you would close the, the gates. The only issue of course, is that this requires maintenance and the gates would have to be tested. And if there is an emergency, you'd have to rely on these gates to work. And the final uh, sort of medium term solution is temporary mounds um, around the plant. So you don't install the, the valves, but you build berms around the plant and localized flood protection um, measures. Finally, the long-term solution is to raise the road. And what we know is this road is at 2.5 meters above, uh, no, plus 2.5 meters CVG 2013. This road will become, uh, reach its design limits in terms of holding back the sea in the year 2070. So in 50 years, this road will reach approximately its, its ability to stop the ocean during a storm uh, and it'll begin to be overtopped by, by storm conditions if these kinds of storms occur. We also see that in the year 2100, the road would have to be at 3.1 meters. So it is very foreseeable that this road has to be raised in the next 50 to 70 years, 50 to 80 years uh, to withstand the pressures from sea level rise and climate change. So this is a bit of a, a menu of, of options um, that are available to protect the plant and, and this area of the community. So that's all I have today. Uh, I really thank you again for your time and welcome any questions at this point. Thank you. And uh, we're about at time, but Sarah, if you did have anything quickly to add, I'd give you an opportunity on this presentation or should I move on to council questions? Do you want, okay. Okay, so what we'll do is have council questions on this presentation now, and then we'll move on to Sarah's presentation for the saltwater intrusion study. Are there any questions from councillors? None? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on then to Sarah. Sarah, the floor is yours. So thank you very much for having me here this evening. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm going to cover the aeration installation and the saltwater intrusion study. And next slide, please, Heather. Okay. First, I'm going to take you on a very quick plant virtual tour. So you have the background on the wastewater treatment plant and then the, the aeration replacement and saltwater intrusion and then questions at the end. Okay. Next slide. Okay, the wastewater is pumped to the treatment plant uh, from a network of nine different lift stations and it first comes into the headworks where large solids are removed and also grit and gravel. It then flows to the bioreactor tanks at number two, which are where all the, um, the bacteria live that remove organics from the wastewater. They do the heavy lifting in this wastewater treatment plant and they need a constant supply of oxygen and also enough uh, space to live on the, uh, the media. Then the wastewater flows to the equalization tank at number three where it is batched before it flows to number four back in the uh, treatment plant main building which contains the DAFs. This is a dissolved air filtration and it means that uh, tiny bubbles are generated that float the solids to the top and its polymer is also added to make them stick, the solids stick together. So this, the solids are skimmed off the top and pumped to the sludge storage tank for further processing. But the clarified water goes to the ultraviolet disinfection unit, which kills off the back, harmful bacteria that are still in the wastewater. Next slide, please. Okay, 
so there were a number of uh, issues that were identified in 2018 and 19 in the uh, CBCL study that we were commissioned to do on the wastewater treatment plant and the collection system. And uh, it involved a number of areas in the plant. And also uh, Dylan subsequently completed a review of this and they uh, agreed with many of the uh, issues that we had identified but also put forth a step-by-step -step process to try to fix the most urgent items and then see how much of an effect that would have um, before making a final decision on what the ultimate um, engineering solution should be. And so the three key issues that I want to point out here are that there was a lot of saltwater intrusion getting into the collection system and being pumped through the plant process and that the aeration system was in very poor condition with worn bioreactor media. So the, the bacteria didn't have enough space to live and they also were not getting enough air. And the third key, um, key item is the outfall location, that the outfall is uh, under the inshore fisherman's wharf. It's, it's too close to shore and it's in a poorly mixed location with potential public access. Okay. Next slide, please. There has been a lot of progress since um, those issues were identified. So the, the general step-by-step -step process has been carried out and a number of things have been, have been fixed. So in the Dorian recovery, some of the equipment was replaced and it was getting anyway to the end of its design life. Um, mechanical equipment often has a design life of about 15 to 20 years and the plant is getting to that age. So it is at the point where it needs some investment to keep it able to meet expectations of the town and of the regulators going forward into the future. As well, the aeration system was in very poor condition and so it was replaced. And there was the flood study carried out that Donker has just talked about and also a saltwater intrusion study to find out where the saltwater was getting in. And next slide, please. So the aeration replacement involved replacing all of the pipework and all of the aeration equipment in the tanks, both the uh, e equalization tank, which you can see here, the aeration system in this tank in the left-hand photo had failed completely and was no longer providing any air to the system in that tank. So on the right, you can see the new system with new valves, pipes, and aerators. Next slide, please. And as well, the bioreactor media where the, the bacteria live on had, been, had become very worn down. It was much smaller than it had originally been. In the process of this project, significant additional media was also added to the tank. So the bacteria would have lots of area to grow on. And you can see the new aeration grid um, in the bottom of the tank in the middle photo and then the functioning tank where you can see all the mixing that's occurring because of the aeration um, that's down at the bottom of the tank. And that mixes those bioreactor media around to make sure that all the bacteria have access to air and to the uh, organic material they need. And this made a big difference in performance. So next slide, please. So this is the, um, the sampling results from the plant for BOD, which is organic material and TSS, which is solids. And it goes from 2018 through to 2020. And you can see that in certain periods of 2018 and 19, the affluent results were considerably higher than the required regulatory uh, levels that are in that at that horizontal line that crosses the graph. So anything above that has exceeded the, the requirements and has not met them. But following the aeration replacement, because the aeration was working so much better then all of the samples taken since that time have complied with the, um, the provincial and federal requirements for BOD and TSS. Okay, next slide, please. There was also an improvement with regard to the bacterial sampling. So this one is uh, fecal coliforms and E. coli. And you can see that in 2018, 2019, at times, especially during the summer when it's the most difficult uh, treatment conditions, the plant did, was considerably exceeding the bacterial requirements. And after aeration replacement, it was significantly improved 
but not to the point where it was always meeting the requirements consistently. So at this point uh, in November, the results are in compliance, but in parts of the summer, they weren't. And we think this is because the UV simply doesn't have enough bulbs yet to, um, to successfully disinfect the water. Next slide, please. So moving on to the saltwater intrusion study, um, five lift stations were investigated, which were thought to be the most likely sources of saltwater getting into the collection system. And next slide, please. And Brook Street is the largest lift station and there was coincidentally a construction project happening at the same time. And so before the completion of the construction project, you can see that the conductivity as measured at the plant is swinging wildly with every tidal cycle. And this means it's extremely difficult for the operators to get good performance. But following this construction project, which extended and separated the sanitary sewer from one of the uh, waterfront businesses, then it dramatically lowered the amount of salt water that was getting into the system as a whole, which was very successful. Um, there was still some infiltration, but it was much reduced. So next slide, please. At Blue Nose Drive, there was also visible salt water intrusion, and this was not affected by the construction project, but uh, we recommend that a lining be installed in the sewer pipe along Blue Nose Drive and also a check valve on the, um, the overflow in order to prevent under storm surge conditions, water from backing up into the lift station and also some sealing of cracks in the manholes. Okay, next uh, slide, please. At Fisherman's Wharf and Back Harbor, these don't normally get saltwater um, intrusion we found, but under storm surge conditions, they are at risk. And so we'd recommend a check valve there as well. On Tannery Road, there was some evidence of, of intrusion of salt water, um, and it looked to be coming from the collection system, but that one is still under investigation. Okay, next slide, please. So just for a, a quick summary, um, there has been considerable work that has been done at the plant, and there's ongoing work as well, um, especially with the DAL uh, process optimization that is happening right now, um, but there are some future steps that would be recommended to go forward with uh, pre-design of permanent um, equipment replacement to make the plant meet expectations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. We'll leave five minutes for questions of Councillor Seven. Councillor Halverson. Could you expand uh, the, so the, the new elements that would be included at the last part of the aid in the pre-design? Are those included in what we've seen here or is this something outside of what's already in our packages? of what's in the package in the staff report. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is what uh, we would recommend that, okay. that you go forward with. Any other questions? Councillor Halverson again. Uh, of what's been proposed here, something I'm, I'm curious about is uh, capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. Any one of these systems is, uh, is there an advantage to going to any one of these systems uh, looking into the future that one would be able to handle more capacity better than another? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And so part of the, um, the RFP as, it, as uh, it's been written up so far includes looking at how it could be expanded in the future because the Project Lunenburg project has that goal of a considerably expanded population. So, um, I mean, in general, we recommend looking at what can make the plant work now for the population you have while making sure you have a plan for the time when you need to expand the plant for additional capacity. Does that answer your question? Or I suppose not exactly. You had asked about which kind of system. They all have expansion capability. It just depends on planning in that expansion capability. Councilor, our Deputy Mayor Mosher. Thank you, sir. So in terms of, you know, pay me now or pay me later. So if you do uh, have something that you know you're going to expand the capacity. So again, what would you recommend and like, like what would be the best system to uh, advance expansion? Well, we generally don't recommend trying to build too much extra capacity into a plant at 
the before you need it, I guess, because you're then paying for assets that are aging, but just sitting there and not working to their full capacity. So I think the most important thing is to have that plan of exactly how you can expand it and then tracking how close it is to its existing capacity and then making the move to design those additional uh, treatment basins or a different media. So for example, the media that you have at the moment is quite, uh, quite large. And so it doesn't have as much surface area as a smaller, more compact media would. You could switch out that media when needed to a smaller media that has a greater surface area. It has that capacity built in. Um, there's also um, expandability with other systems um, that can have just spare space allocated for additional membrane modules, say, um, that will allow the same sort of uh, expansion capability. And so part of the um, pre-design would be looking at exactly how that should be done to have that firm plan in place. Deputy Mayor. And then given the ultimate fate of the sewage treatment plant of being on the water in hundred years. So I've often said like, you know, about, in, you know, in terms, of especially building capacity about having more than one system, more than one plan. And I know that has operational, you know, costs and things along that line. But however, given our future situation is, mm -hmm. you know, what type of system would you suggest knowing that we're going to be underwater there in a hundred years time? Um, I would suggest that steps to defend the treatment plant from water level rise be looked at seriously because it's not just the treatment plant, but also that surrounding area that will be at risk of flooding uh, given the water level rise. Um, the treatment plant as a whole has a design life for the tanks of oh, 50, 60 years. So at that point where it's at serious risk, then you will have had to go through another iteration really of the decision to carry forward with the existing technology or to change technologies in any case. And so at that point, a, a move could be made. We often find that um, communities that have multiple plants struggle to maintain multiple plants and that it works better in one location, all else being equal. Thank you. That's all the time we have for that presentation. I would remind councillors to try and keep their mics close when they're speaking into them so that people at home can here um, and people in the back of the room as well. Uh, so that takes us on to our fourth and final presentation of the night, the wastewater treatment plant UV light and polymer testing analysis with Dr. Graham Gagnon, who I believe is zooming in. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Councillor. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen, but maybe Barring that, one moment, please. I think maybe I ask. Um, I believe we shared our slides, and maybe if if, uh, if we're able to show them there, that might be easier. And I can just, as Sarah did, just ask to the slide to advance. Thank you. So good evening, I'm presenting on behalf of um, colleagues at Dalhousie University, um, in particular, Dr. Amina Stoddard, who's been working very closely with Sarah and her team at CBCL on this project to optimize uh, various aspects of the wastewater treatment plant in Lunenburg. So if we could get the next slide, please. Am I able to move it? Oh, no, okay, thank you. So uh, Sarah detailed some of the treatment plant uh, challenges that are faced, uh, some of the issues around polymer and solids carryover, which she nicely detailed in her presentation. I won't uh, go over those too much, except to say that as part of our project, we'll be looking at these two, two parameters specifically. And polymer and solids carryover not only affect the quality of the harbor uh, receiving the water quality, but also affect the, uh, the ability to disinfect uh, wastewater with UV light. If there's excessive 
particles in the water, it'll be difficult for UV light to disinfect. So uh, we will wanna make sure that we can find out how we can optimize our UV treatment processes as well. So next slide, please. So uh, Sarah detailed some of the, the technologies already, just very quickly. Uh, we will look at dissolved air flotation as an optimization path because this is where the chemical additives are added, namely the, the polymer dose. And uh, we are also, as, as uh, Sarah described, uh, the sort of salinity influences uh, we are mindful of. And so we are not just looking at um, sort of background uh, wastewater under base conditions, but also when it's challenged with higher seawater concentrations. We are uh, looking at UV disinfection using a, uh, a lab-based approach that we've applied to other um, municipalities to try to understand the disinfection capacity of the plant, and I'll describe that later. And then finally, uh, the final aspect of the work is to uh, develop a monitoring um, approach to assess the overall health of the biomass. Um, the um, bioreactor that Sarah described to ensure that we have healthy bacteria that are able to uh, remove the organic carbon or the BOD5 that's present in the wastewater. So next slide, please. Just really quickly about our DAF optimization approach. Um, dissolved air flotation in its, as a technology requires not only the addition of air to uh, float particles, but also the addition of, of chemicals such as polymers to basically make the particles sticky so that they can agglomerate and float and be removed. Um, we are, the DAF system we are currently using is operating at a, at a constant dose. Um, and so we wanna see um, whether or not there are other optimal dosages that could be applied um, to, uh, to improve solids removal off the plant. Next slide, please. This is just a picture of the technology that we're using in the lab. Uh, this is a very standardized DAF jar tester. Um, in essence, what happens, much like the picture that Sarah showed where there was bubbles in the tank that exists at Lunenburg, to the left, you'll see um, uh, air saturation system that will allow air to go into these small jars. And so it's a timed automated uh, process where the air is installed and then our lab students uh, apply the polymer to uh, look at different dosages under different uh, seawater and plant operating conditions. Next slide, please. So this the testing is currently underway and we've uh, provided CBCL with a report and the town with a, a report on where we are. And, and just very quickly, the pictures on the right demonstrate what, again, what Sarah was showing only in a, in a small jar test uh, perspective in that you can see the tiny air bubbles and the separation of the, the solid material to the top as we float the particles to the top and our clarified water at the bottom, which would naturally be passed on to the next uh, process. In this technology, we'll be looking at the removal of suspended solids or TSS that uh, Sarah talked about, as well as the removal of uh, BOD or biochemical oxygen demand. These are the organic material to see what would be the appropriate dose to maximize solids removal and organic carbon removal from this technology. Next slide, please. So removing solids, as I said, is, is critical, not only to the, uh, the harbor's uh, welfare and the aesthetics of the harbor, but also for UV disinfection. And UV light as a uh, disinfection technology is a bit different than chemical technologies that we may use like chlorine for a pool or other types of scenarios. UV uh, basically needs particles not to be in the water so that light can transmit across the water and, and disinfect the bacteria that we are trying to uh, kill or inactivate. One of the challenges with UV lights uh, is that they can foul. And this foul basically means if there's an excess of particles, they may build up on the 
lights on the light bulbs themselves. And so this is not good either. So there's a, there's a real reason, motivation to remove solids. And also, so we are then going to look at the impact of solids, but also ensure as, as Sarah alluded to, to ensure that we have the appropriate design conditions and the appropriate sizing of the UV system under ideal conditions. So next slide, please. So this is a picture of a collimated UV beam. And so this collimated beam is, is a standard based uh, lab procedure that we've used on a number of uh, wastewater facilities in our region, as well as other uh, projects in our lab. And so the beam is basically, you can see a, um, on the left slide um, at the top where underneath Calgon carbon would be a UV light that shines uh, directly, or the energy source for a UV light that shines directly down, downwards through a tube onto a uh, water sample. And you can kind of see the water sample suspended on a um, mixer. Uh, to the right, you can see the sort of blue light of this UV light that just basically shows how we're trying to inactivate or kill the bacteria in a, in a given water sample. So next slide, please. So I apologize for this graph, it's a bit busy and I'll try our best to, to walk through it and make sure uh, colleagues understand what we're trying to show. So um, on the vertical axis or the Y axis is a, a scale that's called MPN per 100 mil. This basically means the most probable number of bacteria per 100 mils of water. And we are looking at two uh, contaminants, E. coli or, uh, and total coliforms. And E. coli and total coliforms are, are regulated parameters in wastewater. And so you can see the dose on the, the bottom or the x-axis um, shows at zero. So then there's no light. Um, the E. coli for the water samples that we've collected, or wastewater samples that we've collected to date would exceed the discharge limit for the, the town of Lunenburg. And then as we move along the dose, the UV dose on the x-axis, we can get to a higher dose of 10, 20, 30, 40, 60. So what this shows is that as the light uh, dose increases to about 30 or 40 millijoules per centimeter squared, we certainly ex achieve our E. coli dis, uh, discharge limit. And 30 to 40 is a, is a sort of practical range that most UV lights are specified for. So we're, uh, you know, obviously to specify at a 30 to 40 millijoule range, it's certainly within the, the reason, reasonable feasibility from a plant specification standpoint. And then on the far uh, right, you see this comment that says plant UV. And so for the samples that we've collected to date, we've also measured the E. coli coming out of the plant. And so we can quickly see that the plant, uh, based on the samples that we've collected to date, which are normally so far have been in the fall. And so if you remember Sarah's uh, presentation, this is normally a good time of year to disinfect wastewater um, as opposed to summer. And so not surprisingly, our plant UV is certainly aligned with the 30 to 40 millijoules per centimeter squared or the, what we would expect as a normal operating procedure. So this is sort of good news uh, from a plant operation standpoint, but obviously we're at a very, very favorable time to disinfect wastewater in Lunenburg. So next slide, please. So the bioreactor or the moving bed bioreactor assessment uh, focuses is on uh, the impacts of salinity because obviously uh, biological um, organisms are very affected by seawater. And we wanna assess the overall health of the biomass and to ensure that we're not inadvertently um, disrupting or killing the biomass because of the salt water or changing it, its uh, composition in any way. And so we are going to undertake a uh, monitoring assessment to look at the, um, the bioreactor under varying water quality conditions. So next slide, please. So this will involve uh, rapid microbial testing and to specifically look at the organisms used in the um, 
in the bioreactor, um, we are planning on using a, what is referred to as an ATP test kit. This test kit is about a five minute test and will allow us to really rapidly assess the um, overall health of the organisms. And our hope is also is to design um, sort of more molecular or DNA based technology to assess the health of the uh, organisms. So next slide, please. So uh, we are currently underway using the ATP test kit and uh, our goal, one of the reasons why we wanna use this is that it's a very simple test that uh, other operators we know can, um, we've trained at uh, pulp wastewater mills and at municipal wastewater plants. Uh, so this should be very um, useful, hopefully for the Lunenburg operations team as well. So next slide, please. So just as a summary, um, our bench scale optimization or lab scale testing is very much aligned with some of the um, design work that Sarah's team at CDCL is leading. And we're hope very much that the data we produce will inform some of their uh, design decisions as they go through and work with uh, Lumen Ultra. Or sorry, with the town of Lunenburg, sorry about that. Uh, next slide, please. So just to, again, acknowledge some of the colleagues that we're working with. Um, so Lindsay Anderson is also on the call and is working very closely with uh, Sarah. Uh, as well, we've our student researchers, Kyle Rao is leading the uh, UV uh, disinfection work and Sheila Fife has been uh, working closely with the, the plant operations team, both on the bio monitoring uh, and on the DAF uh, project. And I wanna particularly thank uh, Kyle and Sheila and the operations staff at Lunenburg for uh, being very uh, supportive and working with our, our students. So with that, I will um, happy to take questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Gagnon. We'll leave five minutes for counselor questions and I have counselor Halverson first and then the deputy mayor. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. There you go. Uh, I understand the polymers are meant to work in the contained system, but I do have a question about uh, we've had issues where it has reached it into the outflow. What risks do the polymers pose to the natural environment, if any? That's a great question. So the polymers um, are, for, for the most part, I would say, or not for the most part, they're designed to be safe to handle because obviously your operations team is handling uh, these, these polymers. And so there is, there's a design element associated with the chemistry of the polymers. But the polymers themselves encapsulate other particles. And so the risk uh, you know, to the harbor or to individuals in the harbor are, are really the particles that are encapsulated in these uh, polymers. So in other words, the very material that we're trying to remove would be the, the harm or the risk to the, the public or to the, har uh, to the harbor. Okay, so the, the polymers themselves, what would happen if they do end up in the harbor, they dis dissipate? Oh, great question. Yeah, so they would, uh, they would dissipate uh, in the sense that they'd either be um, most likely, you know, um, deposited in the harbor floor, which is, you know, certainly not uh, a desirable place. They need to be, to your point, they need to be contained within the wastewater facility. And so, you know, the, the, the important aspect, or work, aspect of this work is to find a condition where we can minimize polymer dose to sort of maximize removal of solids. Deputy Mayor. So Dr. Gagnon, if you came here on a blank slate and you could uh, you know, design a sewage treatment plant for us, what system would you choose? Well, that's a great question, Deputy Mayor. Um, you know, I, I think a couple of things to, to sort of bear in mind on this very important question is wastewater is produced every day. Um, and so we, we uh, you know, we're all gonna, all gonna go home tonight and use our sinks and our toilets and our showers and everything else that we use in our home and we're gonna produce wastewater. So we're gonna need to optimize the current plant whether we like it or not because it takes a while to um, construct and build and design a new plant. So that, that is a sort of a point to remind ourselves that the, why we would need to optimize our current facility. 
in terms of a blank slate, I think what, where um, Sarah was going with the idea of a membrane facility, you know, it's certainly best in class technology. It adds a lot of flexibility to the, the town of Lunenburg, which has, uh, you know, varying population stresses, summer to winter, uh, varying um, uh, activities in, in the town. Uh, and I think, you know, going to, to look at a membrane based technology where we can remove particles robustly and we can find other ways to um, keep our harbor safe. That would be a, a top of mind. I think also this would align well with using UV light disinfection. I would never sort of advocate to abandon that as a technology to disinfect. You would still need to disinfect uh, your wastewater as well uh, from a biological safety standpoint. I hope that addresses your question, Deputy Mayor. Any further questions? I just have one quickly, Dr. Gagnon, then presuming just for the sake of argument, would a membrane technology obviate some of the other necessary upgrades that we're looking at in terms of outfall and that kind of thing? That's a great question. So, um, you know, membrane-based technologies, uh, if, if you can appreciate in some areas where they're a little more water starved than Nova Scotia, places like uh, Arizona or California, uh, membrane based technology are used largely so they can recharge groundwater uh, facilities that then can be used for irrigation or even indeed drinking water. So um, the idea of obligating yourself to other technologies, uh, such as dissolved air flotation or, or other chemical based technologies, I think you'd be well on your path to uh, not using those, those types of technologies, yes. Thank you. Seeing no further questions and being at five minutes and being through our presentations, I thank all the presenters and we will move now to uh, other pieces of business. So there are a number of correspondence items that are provided for council's information. I'm not gonna go through them. Uh, that takes us to business arising from the minutes or unfinished business. And the first piece of business we have um, is under corporate services. And this is a proposed adoption of a revised solid waste management bylaw um, to, by motion to give second reading. And I'll give uh, five minutes to the solicitor for an overview, and then we can go from there. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, for the information of councillors, uh, with your permission, I may remove this so it's clear. Uh, we previously had a solid waste management bylaw which addresses the collection of uh, waste uh, in the town. We have a contract with a hauler uh, who uh, takes our waste streams to Kaiser Meadows, uh, which is the Chester uh, facility. Uh, changes were being made to eliminate the spring and fall uh, cleanup days and introducing provisions for bulky waste. So we amended and are passing a new bylaw and are repealing the old bylaw. So the major changes include um, a, a definition of container. Uh, we've tidied up some of the inconsistencies in the bylaw, uh, grammatical and reference issues and, and definitions. We've made it clear uh, that we recommend but do not require that Freon be removed from freezers, refrigerators, air conditioners, that sort of thing before they are put out as a bulky waste item. Um, my understanding is that uh, if you decided to take a refrigerator to Kaiser Meadow yourself, they would take it without the uh, Freon being removed. Um, we have uh, eliminated the fall and spring cleanup days. Uh, as everybody recalls, uh, you know, every fall and spring, we'd uh, have a day where you could put out tons of items that have been in your garage or basement and, and uh, they would pick them up. And apparently that became problematic for the hauler. Uh, so we can now put out a bulky waste item on green bag day. Um, in the alternative, you can put out an additional clear bag and the bulky waste item that you're putting out is not to exceed hundred kilograms or two uh, cubic meters in volume. 
Um, we removed some redu redundant provisions in the uh, bylaw. Uh, we mo removed the provision concerning placement of ashes in green carts. Apparently that was an issue with some of the, uh, the uh, workers on the trucks because you'd get blowback of the ashes. Um, leaf and yard waste, we removed, we removed references to special collections. We're not having a special collection as such in, in the fall anymore and clarified the provisions. And accordingly, the, uh, uh, there was one additional typo, which uh, uh, has been corrected in the most recent draft sent to you. There was an additional and in clause 23, which has been removed. Yes. Okay, thank you, Pat, for that. Uh, so the mover on this is Deputy Mayor Mosier. I will look for counsel for a seconder, seconded by Councillor Sanford. Um, if there are any questions quickly of Pat on this, seeing none, I'll open the floor to debate on this motion. If anyone would like to comment? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. It takes us on to the proposed repeal of the council procedure bylaw to give second and final reading and uh, Deputy Mayor Mosier has made the motion. Is there a seconder? Councillor Bertels? Is there any debate on this? This has been replaced by our new procedure policy. So that's why we're appealing it. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Additionally, the proposed repeal of the committees and boards bylaw. This is also Deputy Mayor Mosier. You get a lot of work as returning, uh, the only returning councillor, don't you, Peter? Um, I would look for a seconder, seconded by Councillor Ernst. Is there any debate on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Next, we come to the proposed uh, external committee and board appointments for council. Uh, a proposed list was circulated, and I would need a mover and a seconder to proceed. Moved by Councillor Sanford, seconded by Councillor Halverson. Is there any debate on the appointments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. That brings us back to the big ticket item of the night. So we have the wastewater treatment plant and outfall extension uh, project update staff report and draft motion to issue requests for proposals for pre-design engineering services. And with us, we have Ian Tillard to speak to this report. So Ian, 10 minutes, if you like. Thank you, Your Worship. Now I'm loud enough, okay. Um, what I did was uh, created a report that essentially kind of is an overview of how we got to where we are today. Um, so I don't know how much detail I should go through in this, but in given 10 minutes, I'm just gonna basically hit the highlights. So going back some years now, when uh, looking back through all the studies that uh, had been done, uh, when I got here, uh, started off with an uh, outfall extension report from an engineering co uh, company, ABL. They did a uh, uh, assessment of the plant in 2017 looking at various items within the plant. And I'm going to take my mask off. So I'm hard to breathe. Um, uh, following that in 2018, uh, Sarah had alluded to the uh, CBCL did a um, evaluation of the plant and identified some possible options for upgrades. And following that, um, um, Dylan Engineering from Halifax did a review of that report. Now, the um, as we uh, hopefully we all know, the uh, CBCL report proposed three options uh, with significant cost differentials between the three options. The Dylan report really focused on uh, essentially one of those options, which we uh, ended up calling option four, but it was a modification of. Uh, the CBCL option number one, which was an upgrade to the existing plant. Um, both reports really pointed to a number of steps that we need to undertake to really identify what our problems were and identify the unknown, uh, essentially quantities of, of uh, problems that we had in the plant and operational uh, issues. So we've seen some of that tonight, um, the results of some of that tonight. 
and we're continuing to work on these uh, various studies to uh, get to the point where we've got, we think our issues are known, our possible solutions are, can be uh, clearly identified at that point. Um, we're getting close to that point. Uh, some of the, as I won't repeat what uh, Sarah had gone through the, uh, um, uh, some of that information, but one other item that we hadn't discussed was a, uh, collection inflow and infiltration report that was done by CBCL early last year. And that identified our uh, first identified that I'd seen anyway, uh, saltwater infiltration and intrusion from our uh, stormwater system into the, uh, into the plant. And that's identified very clearly that we've, you know, got a significant problem there. Some others, uh, just more or less incidental issues. We did have lift stations that had all kinds of problems that were basically all resolved. Uh, through the over the past year and that hadn't helped us assess what was going on because uh, we had lift stations that weren't working properly. So we then developed uh, through result of the uh, uh, reports given by both CBCL and Dillon last year, we developed a work plan which uh, um, we're continuing to progress with. Um, and uh, I'll just repeat them, uh, things such as the uh, DAF performance review, they dissolved their flotation review. Flood study is now complete. The saltwater intrusion study is uh, virtually complete, um, almost done. We've done a continuous flow trial of the DAFs, the way they're currently operating, and that didn't work out. But uh, as a result of, I think, Dalhousie work, we will see uh, other potentials come up in terms of the DAF operation. Uh, UV testing and assessment, uh, so that's an ongoing uh, as we've already heard about tonight, to see exactly what we need, need to do with the UV system. And uh, with Dalhousie's work on the process testing to look at what optimization we can do with the existing equipment and what improvements could be possible. And I just, I guess to put this in context, there's other issues that we would, we need to deal with uh, in the town. Uh, because they have a direct bearing on our on our sewage treatment plant, so this, these aren't sort of separate issues. So one is on our sewage uh, discharge, what's coming into our system, and we've we had a, a uh, shall we say a, an attempt last year to uh, uh, get that started, and we need to revisit that and re-energize that effort to uh, look at getting our discharge coming out of particularly on our commercial side of businesses to make sure that we know what's coming into our system. Uh, storm water separation, and that's a fairly significant item for this town to see what opportunities we have to separate storm water from sewer. Because what we don't want to do is have storm water going to our sewer plant where we have to treat it. It's an expensive way, uh, way to do things. So uh, we've got a couple of initiatives that we're, we're looking at with regard to that. And, uh, some of it's physically separating the systems and others uh, related to getting uh, things such as rainwater leaders out of our sewer. And the other issue that was a more long-term thing is a master plan for our collection system. We don't have a good model of our, of our collection system. So when we look at assessment of various parts of our system, what watershed effects we have coming into our plant, we don't really have a good handle on that. Um, that's a more of a long-term approach and that'll be a, eventually a, a management tool to operate our system. Uh, Council has seen, uh, I guess, a, a number of presentations going back to December uh, last year uh, with a Dillon presentation of their peer review report, uh, and followed up in March by a CBCL response to, to the Dillon peer review. Um, I think it's safe to say that both those reports really is essentially pointed in the same direction, and that's what's guided us uh, from the recommendations from those reports since that. And in July of uh, uh, 2020, uh, we did a staff presentation report just to basically update, uh, laid out really a lot of the stuff I've just uh, over, uh, provided the overview in this report with. So to quickly review the uh, current status, the uh, MBBR upgrades are complete and results are very good. Saltwater intrusion study, uh, intrusion studies near completion. The other investigative work on the DAF units and UV system are well underway and 
uh, the uh, I guess the essence of that is that it's time so that we can have the results from that kind of uh, from that study work that would be an input into the next uh, engineering phase of the of any um, uh, further upgrades to the plant. Um, and we have since, uh, during the course of this, we've actually written a, a scope of work for an RFP based on a uh, recommended option that uh, we discussed with uh, option number one or option number four, depending on which report you're looking at. And I've just given a quick overview of the uh, scope of work that the RFP would include. I haven't talked about the outfall extension. Um, that was clearly identified as uh, item that was of interest to the town. Um, basically, it's uh, if that's going to proceed, it's really just a matter of uh, well, working through the engineering part of that. It's not uh, it's not a whole lot of background study required for that. So the time sensitivity uh, in terms of we do have uh, some funding approved through I'm not sure who, but. Uh, um, that has a time expiration on it. Um, the funding was identified as uh, uh, funds that we would use on the preliminary engineering phase. So we could see the project uh, coming out in uh, the first phase would be a preliminary engineering phase of clearly identifying what, what, the, uh, um, what the plant would look like. What are, we, what are the design criteria for the future plant um, accommodating such issues as uh, uh, expansion, plant expansion, et cetera, um, and would pr provide uh, class, probably class C estimates uh, regarding that. Following that, would we would uh, naturally go into a detailed design phase. And that is about a six month process just on the preliminary design phase of it. Um, so the recommendation we've got to uh, uh, pr uh, present to council is that uh, following the uh, CBCL and Dillon reports and the work we've done since is to uh, um, issue an RFP for preliminary design of the uh, wastewater treatment plant and based on the uh, um, recommendations that we had been following since then, which was the stuff that we've outlaid, outlined here. So. Thank you, Mr. Tillard. One minute ahead of schedule, which we always like. I will open the floor first to questions of Mr. Tillard and then if council feels comfortable because I know this is weighty stuff, we'll move on to whether you feel comfortable debating the motion. So first I have the deputy mayor and then Councillor Sanford. Uh, thank you, your worship. Well, I guess I'm-, I'm a Sorry, uh, Peter, could you just pull your oh, mic yeah, a little closer? Maybe I take my mask off too. Um, I'm disappointed because I guess when we first started this, uh, this journey, like uh, I wanted to know what technology best fixes our problem for the long term, and uh, and now you know, I mean, when I if I read this correctly, I mean we're well on the way of uh, achieving option four. We've done a lot of the groundwork already by some of the repairs and and the uh, you know that you suggest, is it not? Um, Deputy Mayor, I wouldn't put it that way. Um, we, there was a bunch of work had to be done to that plant regardless. Right, um, so that, and that's what I'm saying. I, yeah. I'm saying it kind of it kind of dovetails with option yes, four. Yes, that, that's yeah. a better way to put it, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and option four is identified by Dylan as being the low cost solution for, you know, for, for that. Yes. So that's that's okay for, for the short term to get us through the necessary. The we have to do it anyway. The necessary steps, yeah. yeah. But I was always a big fan of the membrane technology, as you know, yeah. and it did score very high in the preliminary, uh, you know, score that CBCL did. Um, it's, it seems like, you know, that is the ultimate, you know, solution. And uh, I hate to take this, you know, too far down the road. And we're, you know, like, I mean, we're talking still, you know, in the excess of probably five to $10 million here that we're looking at. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 So, you know, before we spend five to $10 million and I guess also, you know, I've, a, my experience being on council is that every time we make an attempt to make that sewage treatment plant more efficient, it's like one step ahead, two backwards. We did the sludge, you know, to deal with the sludge when I first came on council, that was uh, nearly a million dollar uh, thing. And that created another problem then with odor. And then we put a $1.3 million biofilter in and now we have to 
have water going in that all summer in order to make that work. Pro you know, like, like one solution causes another problem, it, it seems, as we go along, which is why I really was hoping, again, to go back to my original point is to find the, the long-term technology solution on it. The other thing that kind of strikes me out here is the, is the extension of the uh, outflow. In the original CBCL point, it was almost like an ad hoc uh, option that, you know, well, uh, if once we do all these other things, you, you can enhance this by taking that option. And, and then Dylan identifies that it's probably grossly underestimated in terms of cost. So that could be almost, you know, the outflow extension could almost cost what the input of the membranes would be if we get to that point, right? So, and again, with a membrane system, we don't even require a, uh, an outflow extension because the water quality is deemed that it could be for irrigation or even could be converted to drinking water. So that was, you know, another thing that I was looking at. Uh, it also bodes well with capacity increase as well as that, because Project Lunenburg, you know, is, it's not something in the future, it's Project Lunenburg now. So it's like, it's, it's started. <laughs> yep. So it's not yep. something that's, you know, 10 or 12 years down in the future. So I think we have to be uh, we aware of that before we, we start making major expenditures that can't accommodate what our future mm. plans are. Uh, the other always thing that always, uh, upsets me is that when we get these engineering reports, there's more disclaimers in them than there are solutions. So every time there's a, a solution, there's also a list of disclaimers. So what confidence does that give us? And that's why I'm probably very skeptical after sitting through a few of these increases that, you know, our solutions will work in the future. Yeah. I think part of what we've done over the, over the last number of months has pointed to, to the fact that we can actually make that plant work. It doesn't address your other issues there, um, but I, uh, that was an unknown to me and I heard the doubt. Uh, I shouldn't say a doubt, people said, I don't think it's gonna work, but I just never heard any positivity in terms of that plant can work um, because we'd heard the terms of, well, it's a bit of an unusual um, um, technology to use for that application. There's since been some changes to that uh, with the addition of the uh, Fournier press, et cetera. So uh, my assessment of it is that there's a plant that can be made to work there. I haven't heard anybody say it can't work. Now, whether that reaches other long-term goals, you know, that's a different question, I think. Um, so I'm not against using that technology. I had certainly had doubts when I started this little journey off as well. So in terms of looking at a, a different technology and with different goals, I think that's more background work would need to be done to really fully assess that because I really have a serious doubts about uh, the price tag of that to see whether that's a really a $10 million project or is that more like a $15 million project and what's our limit to say, you know, that's, that's great to have that, but I'd love to drive a Rolls Royce, but I can't afford one, you know, um, at what point do we say, okay, this is achievable and that's not, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but I think that question is attached to that that option. That's not just in terms of capital, but it's also in terms of operations, a much more intense plant to operate the, uh, the membrane system. So we'll be need more staff, et cetera, for that, so, yeah. yeah but that, that also is the, the other concern is it's, it's just barely meeting, you know, the requirements that set out now. And, and yes, it can probably be worked better, but obviously, you know, it's probably, you know the, the the bar will get raised higher yeah. and then we will be still catching we always seems to be catching up yeah, with it could be. I, yeah what the future regulations are going to say who knows but um i think th there's a lot of factors associated with that plant barely meeting the grade and you know throwing salt water into the plant and i in my layman's terms i said that that basically sterilizes your plant i'm sure that dr gagnon would, would be horrified somebody <laughs> saying that but it's that type of uh input into that plan has not helped at all so yeah. well that that goes back to one of the things i did read in the dylan report that says probably the absolute number one thing to address is the salt water yeah, exactly when we're doing that so no matter what we do that has yes. to be addressed yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah
Okay, I've got Councillor Sanford. Mayor Rooster, I'm wondering if you can help me to better understand in the context of the Dillon report, there were 13 options and recommendations that, that were made. And I'm just wondering if you, you can help me to better understand how those fit in the work that's already been completed and what is gonna be proposed to be completed in the request for proposals. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, really a lot of the, uh, if I'll use general terms rather than go through each one, which I haven't listed, oh, I do have it listed out. Um, the, the big, uh, I guess, uh, physical piece within that was the uh, MBBR system, which is the, uh, Sarah had uh, reviewed that system, the upgrade to that system. Um, a lot of the performance related things that they talked about in here are things that we're doing either with uh, Dr. with Dalhousie University. Um, we're also engaged talk, uh, talking with the manufacturer about performance improvements and uh, giving them feedback related to the testing we're doing and seeing what they've come back with. Um, so really a lot of it is, the, the virtually the rest of it is exactly what we're doing, uh, I would say. Yeah. I believe the report suggested doing pieces in stages and then assessing how that particular action yeah. resulted in yeah, a positive or a negative outcome. Is that currently taking place? Um, I think it's probably more related to, you know, uh, how we would achieve getting funding. Uh, frankly, it's there. I don't think there was too much in terms of don't, uh, take it to a step and if it fails, then do something else. That's not, I think it was quite positive as to making that plant work mm -hmm. in a step by step, an incremental approach to it. Um, and I, I don't think technically I see much benefit in terms of it's going to change the direction of what we're going. If we go down that road, the scope is fairly clearly identified. Um, there may be issues around an incremental approach in terms of timing, because one of the issues we would have to face here is uh, once we start working in the guts of that plant, we are going to have faced with overflow situations, meaning we're overflowing to the harbor uh, with untreated sewage. Those are very um, uh, clearly uh, clear sort of uh, regulatory affairs in terms of we've got to identify exactly what we're doing when we're going to do it when we're going to stop doing it and you know that type of thing what the extent of that is incremental approach much better to have you know a shorter duration but more than one big long overflow so there's a bunch of issues around that as well yeah. one more if i may um in the three options in cbcl I was surprised at how little focus was spent on the extension of the outfall pipe. So having said that, it was one thing that stood out for me, the weight in the Dillon report put on the extension of the out, outfall pipe yeah. and or relocation, but that being a part of the priority. So I still, as I was listening and you were presenting, you were talking about if, you know, there was a focus on the outfall extension. My question is, what is the focus on the outfall extension in the request for proposals? Uh, it's very clear. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. It's or how I answer that, but it's very much a scope of, uh, part of the scope of work. And we've identified it such that if, if needs be, we can actually separate that project out separately from a plant project. If funding was available for part of that and not the other part, then we could proceed based on that. Would you determine it's a high priority in the process? Oh, absolutely. It's okay. equal to, yeah, yeah. yeah Thank yeah. you. The only question, I mean, technically the, the question with the outfall is what dilution do you want? And that requires some background study and all that good stuff, so, yeah. Thank you, I've got Councillor Halverson, the Councillor Halverson next. All right, uh, well, first off, thanks to you and to everyone involved with this for the amount of work you've put into this. This is a very significant number of uh, hours put into this and, Fantastic work. Um, my curious, I, what does it do to the timeline? And um, we're trying to meet these these funding deadlines. If we decide to move away from option one that yeah. you're proposing, um, we'd have to rethink how we get you know, the the next phase. I think um, I'm just talking off the top of my head at this point. Then we, you know, are, are going to go a, a different direction. I think we need a little time to think about it and to figure out and identify how we're going to identify that scope and costing, because that's going to be a huge issue around that. 
um, and then go, we're going to need help to do that. Um, go find some money to go do that. Um, so we're, you know, it's, we're talking months. We're not talking, it's like a complete change of uh, direction here. Is it going to set this back by two or three years? No, it's not the case, but it would take some time to go back and rethink and uh, refocus a bit and figure out, um, you know, in terms of funding, uh, you know, if you look at the, the preliminary engineering funding that's been, uh, we've gotten, you know, in comparison to the whole project cost, it's not a great, great deal of money. It's still significant to us, but it's not a huge part of the project sort of thing, so. And if I may, Councilor Harrison, just to clarify with the finance director, it's cost shared 50-50 between our gas tax money and the provincial capital assessment program. And so we would lose the portion that would be the provincial capital assessment program. That is correct, Your Worship. There's a potential. I mean, certainly yeah. we, have, we are seeking an extension, but at this point, we, we don't have confirmation that we've received that. So if we blow the deadline, it's 135K. That is correct. Thank you. Um, I want to echo the same concerns that uh, Councillor Sanford and Councillor Mosher made about the outflow pipe. Uh, I, I would say that is a very high priority for everyone in this town. Mm -hmm. And whether that is an, ends up being an actual an extension pipe or you know a change in how that plant operates i, I think that we i think we're all in agreement that that needs to happen um i guess my concern with that is uh, this, uh, to echo what councilor sanford said um, it doesn't really seem to have been a focus um in in some of this report and um yeah i, I guess to my mind, as, as Councilor Mosher said, it seems to have been uh, been answered by you know going with a different option. So, you know, at the risk of perhaps losing, you know, some provincial money, I'm sure there'll be more provincial money down the road. But I'd rather get it right. Yeah. Um, I, I, further to that, though, I would I, I do wonder if we did decide to move to you know a different operating um, uh, system like the memory that we're talking about here. Um, you know, we, we're still going to need to look at, you know, what would need to be done. I mean, do we have any um, uh, any plan as to, you know, if we have to move to a different system, the membrane system, what would be involved in maintaining this plant uh, in operation for the duration until we can get a new plant yeah. up and running? Um, I'll go back to the outfall, but um, uh, in terms of that, there most certainly would be some work that need to be that would need to be done. That I think remains to be seen uh, once we see the Dalhousie testing program and interweave that in with our engineering efforts to see how we get those DAFs working better. Um, we're happy with the, so far with the aeration system with the bioreactor. Um, but again, there may be some, they're, they're assessing that as well. So there may be some additional things. I don't think we're, we're talking about operational characteristics. Um, some of the bigger benefits uh, from the dial work would be if we change a mode of operation, which would require significant uh, capital investment, uh, even for, with the existing DAS. But there are a few recommendable steps along there and certainly would be needed to be done. Um, just going back to the outfall, um, so to be clear that if the plant meets the regulatory requirements, what goes through that outfall meets regulatory requirements. So, you know, maybe this is a, a bit of a glib statement, but it becomes a visual effort or a, something you can see and you know, just rather not see it because what's coming out of there is meets regulatory requirements. So I think that's why when you say it wasn't really addressed, it, it is, it works, the plant works. Now, do we, so the decision is, do we just not want to see it? So let's move it. It's pretty simple. Um, uh, you know, decision uh, process for that. <laughs> Back to that. I think, I think that is the issue. It's the community standard. I think the community is expecting yeah. not to see it. Oh, I heard that loud and clear. Yeah. yeah. And if, if the decision is that we're going to proceed with the outfall now, that's, that project can proceed while we're discussing uh, what to do with the plan. So, yeah. So I have Councillor Sanford and then the Deputy Mayor. Just to confirm, um, building from Councillor Haverson's comment about um, the emphasis the community has on that outfall no, pipe. No. So it's, 
been said to the community in the past that you know the wastewater treatment plant is working fine and everything's working the way it's supposed to and so on and so on and yet issues still continue to appear off and on over time yeah. so even though we may say you know if we go with option z and you know it's going to meet and it's going to do this and whatever i think to councillor haverson's point we need to continue to move forward and address that that's a major concern for the community and it needs to be addressed yeah. Yeah, and as I, as I say, it can that project can proceed basically tomorrow. It's a very it's quite a simple uh, um, scope of work to actually proceed with that project in terms of the uh, preliminary engineering. Yeah. So we have the deputy mayor, and I'll remind councillors we're doing mostly questions now. We are waiting into commentary. So if if anybody wants to put the motion on the floor, they can. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Yeah, it's probably more commentary than I have been substance. So. I'll allow it because we've allowed <laughs> others, but I'm just calling time after this. Well, I just sort of, uh, I, I, I think funding is not always the driver to prioritize options. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing I want to drive home because that's what got us in this problem in the first place. That's why we have the sewage treatment plant because funding drove, you know, the, the uh, was the driver to prioritize that plant being built. And we're all paying for it ever since. It would be interesting to know how much money we have spent on that over the years beyond regular maintenance. It just, I mean, not that it's we need to know that right now, but it might be at some point an interesting number to uh, to ask staff to come back with us. So, and and that's the other thing that you know I I worry about is that we'll get the scope of work done, and then all of a sudden we we find funding for the wrong thing, and and we're doing you know step three before step one, and you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we find out that we should have did something completely different. And then we never would have had to do the steps that we did. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's what really worries me more than anything. So yeah, good piece. All right. So if there are any questions of Mr. Tillard in regard to his presentation, we will leave it there. Otherwise, I will open the floor if anybody would like to put the proposed motion on the floor. If council is not comfortable with that, we can resume discussion on this at our December 8th meeting. I'm seeing. I have no trouble to resume that. I, I would. I would reframe that. I, if if I put the motion on the floor, your worship, I would. I I'd change it somewhat. But I think probably the best course of action, perhaps, is to defer. I think we're getting the feeling from council that this could be reconvened at our December eighth meeting when everybody's had a little time to digest. Okay. That takes us on to the operating manual project and draft motion regarding that, Mr. Tillard. Uh, as soon as I find it. Oh, there we go. Um, thank you, Your Worship. So uh, I won't go through too much detail on this, um, but uh, as of the end of August, uh, we were notified by the regulator that we had two outstanding conditions for our operating um, approval. Um, the dis disposal of residuals plan and an operations manual. And we've since addressed the disposal of uh, residuals um, issue and submitted that to the regulator. And that's you know, it's been fine. So we now need an operations manual um, and we need it fairly quickly. Um, so I'm hoping this is one of our last surprising moments uh, with our plants. Um, we had, uh, um, talk with the regulator and been given a deadline of uh, January 29th uh, for the operating manual. So, um, and our, my opinion is that uh, uh, we've got, um, uh, Sarah has been intimately involved in that plant, knows the plant inside out. And in terms of a, a cost and timing exercise, uh, my recommendation is that we uh, proceed in getting that manual written with uh, CDCL. And that's what my motion reflects. Okay, uh, so the motion is there. If anyone would like to move it, I would still move the motion, Your Worship. You need it for be read. No, don't. We don't need it read. It's written there for everyone's benefit. Right. So moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Halverson. Um, we'll just note the absence of Councillor Ernst. Uh, if we come to a vote, is there any debate on the motion? Councillor Halverson. Seeing nobody putting up their hand for debate. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. 
That moves us on to the Tannery Road proposed sidewalk project staff report and draft motion. Mr. Tillard, still on the hot seat. Yeah, Let's thank you, Your Worship. This, my, this has become my favorite project. And I, uh, sorry, <laughs> and aside, and aside for this, the, the very first day I, I met with me and Kathleen, and one of the very first things that Kathleen brought up, and will you do something with that sidewalk over there? So anyway, that was, that was from day one. Um, background very quickly is that uh, we uh, design was done a couple of year, years ago to uh, for a proposed sidewalk along that north side, I guess it is, of Tannery Road. Um, we costed it out last year uh, at a tune of, I think, $255,000 to get the thing uh, built. Um, it was thought at the time, well, maybe we could do it in-house, and that's what this report reflects, that if we do do it in-house, yes, there is a cost saving of, I think, fifty or $55,000. Um, but through my, uh, I guess, my experience now with the town over the last year, um, I see a lot of things that we, we uh, you know, our, our forces are really good at doing uh, uh, work underneath the ground on the more sort of vital assets in terms of our um, and sidewalks are a fairly straightforward thing to build. So, um, you know, given the time that would take a time estimate of about eight weeks of our crew's time to build this, I think it's pretty low value uh, use of their time. Um, so my recommendation is that we would proceed back to plan A, essentially, um, and sorry, a little bit more background. Land agreements never were signed initially for the project, which was, sorry, proposed some years ago. Uh, so the very first step is dealing with the land issues related to this. So my my proposal is to or motion is to proceed with that land um, negotiations, which estimated based on figures from, uh, previously was uh, fifty five thousand dollars, I think. And then at that point, uh, once those are settled, then uh, uh, proceed with the design uh, design build RFP at that point with the council today, whenever that might be. I don't know how long land agreements would take to do, but uh, uh, it's certainly not a short term thing. It's probably in many months, if not, uh, if not longer. So. All right, we'll open the floor to questions on this report from Mr. Tillard. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Worship. So Mr. Tillard, are you willing to find that $50,000 out of your budget somewhere that we would have to spend otherwise? Um, that's a good question. What did we say about that? <laughs> well, we should probably have identified a little more clearly where uh, the options are. I think this was, uh, Lisa, correct, help me out here, but I think it was something we had talked about for next year's budget to put it in the budget and to proceed from that point. Uh, uh, yes, if I may, Your Worship, but I, I think probably the Deputy Mayor was alluding to where do we find that additional funding. I think it's, it's yes, there is the cost of the additional funding, but it's an opportunity cost to have, that, that's what Mr. Tillard is referring to, that if the entire crew is, is allotted to that during the summer, there will be many other missed opportunities for regular maintenance and and projects, oh. and so it's it's an opportunity yeah. cost. I, I understand that part, and I, yeah. I appreciate your I appreciate where you're coming from with that as well. Uh, but it is 50k, and um, you know, and just some some other things like you know, I know I questioned once before the design, like we're we're taking the the design that was given to us by I forget whatever the consultant is again, the, yeah. the project yeah. was. consultant company, yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, explore that starting the sidewalk off on the south side and then at some point in time crossing the street on Tannery Road where it makes sense because obviously the houses are there at some point in time, just there's no room. That may help. And uh, I did hear already that, uh, you know, mentioned that Avco, that you could build behind those trees. You wouldn't have to necessarily take all those trees down if we the landowner is we had that discussion with APCO and they, yeah. they didn't, in the end, they said, we don't want you coming that far into our land. Okay. So they said, just yeah. stick with your plan. So, okay. yeah. So I guess just that, that's, the, you know, a few little things. I mean, I, yeah. I have a big desire to see this happen. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, I, I don't want to rush it and do it the wrong way, but I do want to really see it moving. So I'd be happy to make the motion to, uh, to see how the rest of the council feels. Okay. 
We'll just open the floor for further questions, if there are any. Seeing none. Oh, Councillor Halverson. Uh, again, this is you know our first real look at this. I'm just curious what what community feedback we had about uh, about this project, and you know what what's the feeling of the residents about the location of the sidewalk and and the crosswalk. I was not here when that layout was done, so I don't know if there's much in the way of essentially public consultation. Uh, the landowners uh, that are associated with it obviously were, had discussions with landowners. There was one landowner that I think he was dead set against or he was against it. I don't know, dead set against it. I don't even know if he's still a landowner because there's been three, I believe two or three properties changed hands since all this started from 2017 or whenever it was. So, yeah. Councillor Sanford with a question. This is re relatively new for me. So can you explain to me how far over it goes? Like, does it go right to the um, entrance to where the golf course is? Like, does it go? Uh, no, um, where that parking area is along the seawall yes. is now, uh, there's a, we're greening that area into a little parkland that's gonna end up there. So it goes past the last house, essentially, or to the end of the last house heading towards the golf course. And then you're gonna go into that uh, little park area that we're in the process of developing that as well. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Duggan. The cost that you um, quoted there, is that the cost that was given for the project years ago when it was? Uh, I did update that and I just did discuss with the engineers and actually I think I upped the uh, rates on the sidewalk rate a little bit uh, as well, so. Okay. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with them. Yeah. Um, just having said that, um, if we're doing that today, it would be a little cautious only because we've seen so far and a little bit of work we have done that we've had a COVID kind of impact on on pricing. But hopefully, by the time that that gets settled after land issues are done, that's that's passed. It's well, hopefully past that. So. Yeah. Okay. You may. Uh, which was part of the reason why when uh, Mr. Tiller and I were working on the recommendation was sort of to delay it to that, to try to avoid a COVID premium yeah. in having that installation work and that it may allow us an additional opportunity to not have to fund the balance of it with debt, that we would have some time to accumulate additional detransfer tax that we could allocate towards that. Thank you. And your worship, I just might just for people's uh, information and just for future, um, when these type of civil projects are tendered, uh, the, the type of companies that tender these line the work up in the spring. So we're far better off tendering anything in the spring. And when you go to the market in August, they've already booked out their year and they're just saying, well, that's now icing on the cake. So what was a hundred dollars now is 130 or $140. So. Thank you, Mr. Tillard. Any further questions? Seeing none, or uh, on a question, Deputy yeah, Mayor? If yes. I do, just through to Lisa. So what would be the possibilities of having a grant or a funding for this, this particular project? I haven't seen anything currently, uh, Deputy Mayor, but that doesn't exclude that, 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 you know, there are, you know, grants that occasionally come up for active transportation. Um, and if we had settled the land ownership, we'd certainly be in a better position because we would know that we would be proceeding with the work. Um, so I don't think we would have a grant for that component of it, but the, the construction component, there's certainly, you know, we're always keeping our eye out for those kind of things. But uh, yeah, it, we'd certainly be looking for that. Thank you. For further questions. Okay, Ms. Renton. We haven't moved the motion yet. I'm getting to that. No worries. Uh, so seeing no further questions, uh, the mover was the deputy mayor and I believe Councillor Ernst wanted to second. I would, uh, yes, I just want to just make a statement to that as well. Uh, given the fact that uh, anything to make that section of town more uh, pedestrian friendly, which at the moment is not, especially keeping in mind the fact that there is some new development going along there that I think will be uh, quite uh, beneficial to have some more walking room. I'd be very happy to second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Ernst. So the mover is the deputy mayor, the seconder is Councillor Ernst. Is there any debate now on the topic? I see the deputy mayor. I just would like to uh, express to Mr. Tiller that in the RFP uh, design that, you know, you would still explore the option of some south side 
access there with you know before sure. yep. before we finalize it. Yep. Thank you. Any further debate on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. That takes us on. There are no recommendations or motions coming out of committee meeting minutes. Um, that takes us on to new business, corporate services, a fairly simple request from the Masonic Lodge to reproduce the town logo. Uh, there's a motion provided and the motion also includes staff amending the policy so that these kinds of things need not come to us again, which the chair is very much in favor of. Can I get a mover? Moved by Councillor Ernst, seconded by Councillor Bertels. Is there any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. Next, we have the budget 2021 variance report to September 30th, including the announcement of a federal provincial COVID relief and the safe restart agreement funding. There's a staff report and draft motion and I will allow uh, five minutes for uh, Ms. Dagley to speak to that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. So the variance report was prepared for Council's information and provides an update to the budget progress. Uh, this report is till September 30th, which is 50% of our fiscal year. Um, as this is a new Council, and this is the first time perhaps that we're reviewing the uh, variance report, and just a brief overview. So pages one through eight provide you a status update on each of the capital projects they're uh, listed in order of uh, capital projects for the town, the water utility, and then the electric utility. Following that on page, this one flip, page nine, you will find a summary of the operating uh, amounts to date. And it will also include references for any uh, particular departmental items that should be brought to council's attention. On page 10, you'll find a summary of the deed transfer tax collected, the collections on the tax and sewer uh, amounts for the year, and uh, parking meter revenues as well. And then the last page of the report is the grants for the current year. There are this evening two motions included in the report. Um, as uh, your worship has mentioned, that we did receive some uh, safe restart funding in the amount of $287,930 in early November. Um, it is staff's recommendation that this funding that was received to offset lost revenue and additional operating costs related to the impact of the COVID pandemic be taken into operating revenue at this time. And there is a motion there that supports that. And in addition, there is a motion regarding a grant to the Lunenburg Board of Trade in the amount of $1,000 for Christmas holiday seasonal promotions. And there is a motion to support that as well. Thank you, Ms. Dagley. Are there any questions on these items for Ms. Dagley? Councillor Duggan. Is there any point in actually um, approving that Lunenburg Board of Trade grant um, considering the state that the province is in at this point? What, what does that money go towards? I'm just curious. If I, if you wish, you wish. Uh, I believe that there, it was for a holiday, a per, like a residential holiday decorating contest um, and for prizes for that and some advertising for shop, shop for Christmas. Yeah, so it's, they've obviously they've canceled the normal activities that they would put on at this time and coordinate. So in light, in place of those, they've done a couple of things. So they're having a, a lighting contest for residential, um, for residents and businesses. And it's just to contribute to those kinds of things. So it's all within public health requirements. It's the alternative program that they're putting on that we're giving a grant to. So the first motion is to take the safe restart funds into operating uh, revenue for fiscal 2021. Can I get a mover? Moved by Councillor Sanford, seconded by Councillor Halverson. Is there any debate on the motion? Deputy Mayor. P 
Pardon Mike. Me. Uh, what are the options for uh, for this uh, safe restart funding? Sorry. Um, so the, some of the details are, are difficult to uh, gather as I, as I noted in our report, but the funding is intended to offset revenues that were lost, you know, such as parking meter revenues, recreational fees, um, et cetera. And that to all help us offset additional costs that we have for extra PPE for staff and, and those sort of things. So, um, as far as what reporting we will have to have for what expenditures or whatever that we use towards that, I, I still don't have those details, unfortunately. Any further discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Somebody like to move the $1,000 grant moved by Councillor Bertels, seconded by Councillor Duggan. Is there any debate or discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. And the final item we have for new business is a notice of motion from the deputy mayor to amend the committee's and proceedings policy. Uh, your worship, did we do the, uh, the lodge? Yes, we did. Yeah. Right. So I? quick you didn't even notice. Where was I? <laughs> All right, I would so give uh, notice a motion to, uh, of the proposed amendment for section three as written here in the, uh, in, the minutes, in the in the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Moser. Um, that does not require a second as it's a notice of motion and that is to set the regular meeting time for these council meetings at six o'clock in accordance with policy. Um, and uh, that will come before us at the December 8th meeting for a vote. So then we will um, need a motion to recess to meet in camera. First went to section 22 of the Municipal Government Act to consider the agenda items listed. Moved by Councillor Halverson, seconded by Councillor Sanford. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried and we will recess for 10 minutes and resume in camera. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 